the congregation shivered in the cold. Notre Dame echoed with the sounds of 400 musicians and singers. Napoleon Bonaparte was about to be crowned Emperor of France. If I have any ambition, he said, it is so natural to me, so intimately linked with my existence, that it is like the blood that circulates in my veins. It was December 2nd, 1804. Napoleon was 35 years old. His faith in his guiding star had been justified. Riding the tide of revolution that shook all of Europe, the young lieutenant from Corsica had ascended to the rank of general, married the woman he loved, Josephine de Beauharnais, and with victory after victory on the battlefield, made himself the most powerful figure in France. There's this young Corsican bringing whole empires toppling, kings losing their thrones, causing this magical belief in him. An enormous presence, with a coil spring intensity, like a bomb about to go off when he entered the room. C'est une ambition en marche. He is ambition in motion. As time went by, he only had confidence in himself. He considered himself invincible. Napoleon mounted the steps to the altar alone. Seizing the crown in his own hands, he held it aloft. Then, brought it to rest on his own head. As 1805 began, Napoleon was planning to cross the English Channel and invade Great Britain with 2,000 ships and 200,000 soldiers. The French and British were at war once again, irreconcilable enemies struggling for dominance on the continent of Europe. I think Napoleon reckoned that if he got across the Channel, his chances would have been excellent, and he was probably right. We had no army, we had a pathetic army, and Napoleon seemed to be invincible. As he said, if I'm master of the channel for six hours, I will be master of the world. I will take you to London, he told his Empress Josephine. I intend the wife of the modern Caesar to be crowned in Westminster. To the British, Napoleon seemed capable of fantastic deeds. He might fly over the channel or dig a tunnel beneath it. The bogeyman, or bony man as they called him, might be coming any day. We despised him and the cartoons of the time were incredibly vicious. Napoleon was portrayed as a little Corsican upstart and Josephine as a tart. He was a little dwarf facing the great might of the British establishment. On the other hand, um, mothers would tell their children at night, if you don't say their pr your prayers, Bernie will come and get you. But Napoleon needed ships to carry his men across the channel 
and his fleet was no match for the British, the most powerful maritime force in the world. The Royal Navy was always there, and Napoleon says at one point, in despair, wherever I went, I always found the Royal Navy. And by August of 1805, he realized that the invasion of England was just not on. At the end of the summer, Napoleon paraded his soldiers along the Channel shore. Then, to everyone's surprise, ordered them to turn their backs on England and march into Europe. Austria and Russia had joined Britain in an alliance to destroy him. Already, tens of thousands of Russian soldiers were lumbering forward to unite with their Austrian allies. Napoleon had inherited the struggle begun over 10 years before, when revolutionary France faced off against the monarchs of Europe who were determined to crush the revolution before it spread. Napoleon inherited this extraordinary dynamism left over from the French Revolution. Everybody who had a crowned head, they thought, well, you know, uh, what happened to Louis XVI might happen to him. Napoleon represents the revolution and the expansion of the revolution. Not only the territorial expansion, but the expansion of revolutionary ideas. Napoleon goes into Europe with his bayonets, but also with the civil code. Restless after long months of waiting, his soldiers were eager to fight. They were superbly disciplined, hardened veterans of the wars in Italy and the Rhineland. Napoleon called them La Grande Armée, the Great Army. They were the most feared men on the continent. They could begin marching well before dawn, and with little rest, continue until nightfall. The emperor has discovered a new way of waging war, one soldier said. He makes use of our legs instead of our bayonets. Measure yourself carrying between 40 and 60 pounds of uh, rations and musket and cartridges. Most of them are farmer's boys. Grown up used to misery and walking and working from day to night. And these men would march something like 30 miles in a day. They'd march for four hours and stop, and then march another three or four hours and then stop again. And they would forage as they went. I mean, they would have to worry about these big supply trains behind them. The Grande Armée was an impressive sight. The splendid uniforms helped a soldier feel stronger, bigger, and braver than he was. Made him forget the brutal facts of warfare. They would fight for riches, the glory of France, and devotion to their emperor. Once, uh... He said, who's the bravest man in this unit? Uh, the officer said, this man. He took the Legion of Honor off his own coat and stuck it on the soldier's uniform. Can you imagine how that would spread in the army? His soldiers idolized him, eager for just a few words of praise or an even greater tribute, saved only for the bravest, an affectionate yank on the ear. He stood five feet, two inches tall. With one hand thrust under his coat, he struck a pose common at the time and made it his own. His little coat and hat were a kind of propaganda because he created a simple character, austere but very recognizable. He appealed to the, to the privates by wearing clothes like that. Here is a man who dresses like we do, like the soldier does, like, not like the generals and the marshals, but like us. Napoleon drove his men hard, but he drove no one harder than himself. 
He could ride for 10 hours at a stretch, often eating lunch on horseback. He slept in a tent or under the stars, lying down on his camp bed at eight and rising after only a few hours sleep to spend the rest of the night studying reports and issuing orders. He still found time to write Josephine, reminding her of his love and showering her with kisses everywhere. Summer turned to fall. Napoleon's soldiers marched deeper and deeper into Europe. Waiting were two enemy armies that outnumbered them almost two to one. The Russians and Austrians planned to defeat the French by sheer force of numbers. The Russians and the Austrians thought that they would lick him. They were quite convinced that once they got him in the center of Europe, they would finish him off. But Napoleon saw at once the flaw in the Allied strategy. Their forces were widely dispersed across the continent. By moving quickly, he could strike at the Austrians before the Russians arrived. Well, he will swing in across Germany and cut off the leading Austrian forces. His plan is just hit first, hit with massed forces, and catch these boys before they can all link up. In less than six weeks, the French reached the Danube catching the Austrian army of General Karl Mack by surprise. While his enemy wavered, Napoleon struck the decisive blow. comes down behind him, and any sensible general would have run. But uh, the Austrian general there, Mach, decided he'd make a fight for it. And so he held his position. Napoleon just whipped his army around him and uh, isolated him and forced him into surrender just in a matter of days. Twenty-seven thousand men surrendered. Mack had lost almost his entire army. I did not intend to fight any but the English, Napoleon told the defeated Austrian general, until your master came along and provoked me. All empires come to an end. Now, nothing stood between Napoleon and Vienna. I have been rather overdone, my good Josephine. Eight days spent in soaking rain and with cold feet have told on me a little. But I have accomplished my object. I have destroyed the Austrian army by simply marching. Napoleon, having moved with this great speed, 200,000 men marching 500 miles in 40 days. So there he has already, he's defeated half the Austrian army. Fourteenth, Napoleon led his soldiers into Vienna, capital of the ancient Austrian Empire. streets, he portrayed himself as the representative of the French Revolution, a symbol of freedom and enlightenment. 
but many who had once worshipped him had by now changed their minds, including Ludwig Beethoven. Lorsque Napoléon when Napoleon decided to make himself emperor, Beethoven denounced him as a vulgar person who lowered himself to the level of an ordinary king. Beethoven had dedicated his third symphony to First Consul Bonaparte. Now he angrily blotted out his name. Emperor Napoleon, he said, is nothing more than an ordinary mortal. He would trample on all human rights and become a tyrant. Two months before, Napoleon had been encamped on the English Channel. Now the Viennese elders were giving him the keys to their city. But his triumph had been shadowed by a disaster. On October 21st, the British Admiral Horatio Nelson had caught a French fleet at Trafalgar and utterly destroyed it at the cost of his own life. Great Britain had lost its greatest sailor. But never again would the French challenge the might of the British Navy. Napoleon no longer had a fleet he could count on, and now in December 1805, the Grand Army itself was in danger. Although Napoleon had crippled the Austrian army and driven the Emperor from Vienna, his conquest threatened to become his undoing. It is winter, it is December, it is cold, he's surrounded by a hostile population. The Russians are coming to help the Austrians. His, his troops are dwindling in number and in supplies. He was almost a thousand miles from Paris. All of Europe had become a deadly trap. He was deep in the center of the continent. Prussia was now threatening to declare war. And on November 22nd, the Russian and Austrian armies finally united in a single fighting force. 90,000 allies against 75,000 Frenchmen. You might say any sensible man would have stopped and perhaps done a deal with the Russians and the Austrians. He really had two choices, either to uh, go back or go forward. Napoleon would never go back. So he thought, you know, one more battle. As November drew to a close, Napoleon roamed the countryside, studied the battles of Frederick the Great, pored over maps. Then he pointed to a spot not far from the little village of Austerlitz. It was a hilly field bounded by woods, marshy ponds, and small towns. Here he would make his stand. Looking it over, the emperor told his marshals, Gentlemen, examine this ground carefully. It is going to be a battlefield. You will have a part to play upon it. Seventy thousand Russian soldiers would have a part to play, too. Commanded by the Tsar himself, Alexander I. Just 28, he was eager, one of his aides said, to experience and win a battle. To cover himself with glory by defeating the invincible Corsican upstart. Vain, inexperienced, the young Tsar was an easy target for one of the greatest strategists who ever lived. Napoleon was outnumbered. But if he could control the battlefield, make the Tsar attack him when and where and how he wanted, he had a chance to carry the day. The battlefield at Austerlitz was dominated by a gently sloping hill the Pratzen Heights. If I wanted to stop the enemy, Napoleon said, it is there that I should post myself. But that would lead only to an ordinary battle, and I want decisive success. Napoleon's army controlled the heights, but he would now sacrifice his commanding position in a daring gambit to lure the Russians to attack his right flank. With a thin line of soldiers on his right, he ordered his men to abandon the heights and watched as enemy forces occupied it. 
Napoleon knew his man. The Tsar called a council of war and argued for an immediate attack. The Russian general Mikhail Kutuzov objected. Blind in one eye from a battle wound, the hard-drinking veteran was contemptuous of his Austrian allies and wary of Napoleon. Kutuzov, uh, Kutuzov tried to calm the Tsar's fervor. He sensed the trap. Perhaps he didn't understand the trap, but he felt it. He was an old fox. The night before the battle, Napoleon dined on his favorite campaign dish, potatoes fried with onions. All across the French camp, his soldiers settled into their evening chores. He had already inspected the troops and sighted some of the cannon himself. He appeared a model of optimism and confidence. As he rode past his men, they shouted, Long live the Emperor, and waved flaming torches. The camp blazed with light. It was December 2nd, 1805, the first anniversary of his coronation. Napoleon told an aide, this is the finest evening of my life. Daybreak came with an impenetrable fog. The top of the Pratsen Heights floated like an island above the sea of mist. Napoleon's soldiers woke early and shook off hunger and fatigue. Each man preparing for a fight he knew might be his last. The main killer was probably the artillery. You were just uh, blown apart, ripped apart, or had a neat hole put through you. Coming in close, when it did get to bayonet fighting, why it was usually pretty deadly more killed than wounded. And uh, there was uh, then, of course, the infantry musket, the heavy lead slugs. Those really smashed and tore. Modern rifle bullet punches a neat hole, but these things just ripped and they shatter bones and take out whole sections of the flesh. From his command post on the Pratsen Heights, the Tsar, eager for battle, ordered the Allies down off the high ground toward the far end of Napoleon's weak right flank, anchored in the little village of Telnitz. Napoleon had a surprise waiting for them. Two divisions of soldiers he had summoned from Vienna. They had covered the 70 miles in only two days. Napoleon Napoleon had put reinforcements where they were least expected and faster than anyone thought possible. His troops, exhausted after their long march from Vienna, struggled to hold on. So far, Napoleon said, his enemy was behaving like they were conducting maneuvers on his orders. Napoleon had wanted the enemy to attack his weak right. He now had enough troops to defend it, more than enough for his own plan. An attack on the Pratsen Heights, which was left with few defenders. Napoleon watched from his command post above the battlefield, waiting to spring his trap. 
Hidden in the haze at the bottom of the valley below the heights were two French divisions, 17,000 men. Napoleon gave the order to advance. One sharp blow, he said, and the war is over. The fog was so dense the French soldiers could barely see ten paces in front of them. As the sun began to rise, Napoleon's army appeared out of the mist. On the top of the Patsen, the Tsar watched the French materialize out of the valley. They come out of a clear sky, he told an aide. Your Majesty, his aide replied, you should rather say they come from hell. Alexander didn't know what to do. He was at an absolute loss. From that moment on, he completely lost control of his army. After the panic on the heights, he no longer participated in the battle. Finding themselves attacked when they thought that they were the attackers, Napoleon said, they looked upon themselves as half defeated. By 9.30, the French controlled the Pratzen Heights, demolishing the center of the Allied position. Napoleon swept across the battlefield and attacked the Allies from behind. By 5 o'clock, Austerlitz was silent. Nine thousand Frenchmen were killed or wounded along with 16,000 Russians and Austrians. The Tsar and his army retreated. But the Austrian Emperor himself, Francis I, came to sue for peace from the little Corsican artillery lieutenant who had made himself an emperor only one year before. A battle was fought today, Francis wrote his wife, which did not turn out very well. Napoleon wrote Josephine, I have defeated the Russian and Austrian army commanded by the two emperors. I'm a little tired. I embrace you. Austerlitz had raised Napoleon's star to new heights. He had won his greatest victory the victory of which he would always be the proudest. Soldiers, he said, I am pleased with you. You have decorated your eagles with an immortal glory. You will be greeted with joy, and it will be enough for you to say, I was at the Battle of Austerlitz, for people to reply, there goes a brave man. victory was cause for wild rejoicing. Peace seemed at last assured. Six months later, Napoleon was still deep in Europe, preparing for war again. Among the established sovereigns, he said, war aims never go beyond possession of a province or a fortress. With me, the stake is always my existence, and that of the whole empire. Conquest alone made me what I am. Conquest alone can keep me there. 
Alarmed by France's growing power, now the Prussians challenged him. Napoleon made short work of them. The idea that Prussia could take the field against me by herself, he said, seems so ridiculous that it does not merit discussion. In less than three weeks, he brought the Prussians to their knees, taking 140,000 prisoners, leaving 25,000 dead or wounded. The might of the Prussian army had been entirely crushed. Napoleon marched triumphantly through Berlin to the strains of the Marseillaise, invoking the revolution, equality, and the abolition of privilege. Now master of most of Western Europe, he swept away feudal laws and forced the nations he had conquered to accept the new ones he had created for France, the civil code. But he did not govern in the name of liberty. I have come to realize, he said, that men are not born to be free. Liberty is a need felt by a small class of people whom nature has endowed with nobler minds than the mass of men. He reigned like kings of old, with 44 different palaces, including Fontainebleau. He believed his own glory, the glory of France, and the spirit of the revolution were all one and the same. Like a good Corsican family man, he made his brothers and sisters royalty. Louis became King of Holland, Joseph, King of Naples, Jerome, King of Westphalia. I need my family to stabilize my dynasty, he said. If I distributed thrones according to merit, I should have made different choices. He made Sister Caroline a queen, Pauline a princess, Elisa a duchess. To his mother he awarded the title Madame Mère. Napoleon always had a lot of respect for his mother. He always remained his mother's child, even when emperor. She was amazed by the success of her son. And she was afraid it wouldn't last. She was supposed to have often said, in her thick Corsican accent, just as long as it lasts. While Napoleon spent long months on campaign far from France, Josephine passed the time at Malmaison. She was uncomfortable living in the palaces of the great royal families. I was never made for so much grandeur, she said. I can feel the queen's ghost asking what am I doing in her bed. Malmaison was Josephine's refuge. There she tended to her gardens, importing exotic plants, trees, and flowers from all over the world. Although Napoleon was no longer the inexperienced youth intoxicated by her erotic charms, he remained deeply attached to her. He considers me, Josephine told a friend, one of the rays of his star. Napoleon found in Josephine a woman who met all of his desires. She was an admirable empress. She complimented him. As Napoleon said, I win the wars and she wins people's hearts. Josephine appeared more in love now than ever before though she and her husband often quarreled. He objected to her spending, nearly one million francs a year on clothes alone. She was jealous of his mistresses. But he made love much the same way he ate his meals, quickly. My mistresses, he said, do not in the least engage my feelings. Power is my mistress. 
He could not understand why Josephine was upset. She takes things far too seriously, he said. She is always afraid that I shall fall deeply in love. Can she not understand that love is not for me? They were just passing relationships, and Josephine made more out of them than she should have. In the end, over time, they created a real partnership. They had risen to the heights together. If Josephine had given him a son, he would have been the happiest man in the world. As 1806 drew to a close, Napoleon was still at war. Austria and Prussia had both surrendered. But the Russians, bloodied after Austerlitz, and Great Britain, all power. on the seas remained dangerous enemies. Against Britain, he made economic warfare, a continental blockade forbidding the European nations to trade with the British Isles. To defeat Russia, he marched his soldiers deep into Poland. Napoleon's justification is you have to take the war to your adversaries and you have to defeat them whatever it takes. So going uh, out uh, to the, the, the far reaches of Poland, if that's what it takes to, to, to get the Russians uh, to capitulate, that's what he's going to do. Napoleon was in Warsaw when he was stunned by the news of a surprise Russian attack. He struck back at once first at Eilau, just 130 miles from the Russian border. Then, later, in nearby Friedland. carnage in both battles was terrible. 70,000 French and Russian soldiers killed or wounded. It is not combat anymore, a Russian general wrote the Tsar. It is butchery. Napoleon's army was torn and bloody. The Tsar's army was in ruins. Alexander puzzled over what to do next. When Alexander I was thinking about what to do after the Battle of Friedland, his brother Constantine said, Sire, if you were considering fighting the French, you might as well give each soldier a gun and let him put a bullet in his head. The result will be the same. On June 25, 1807, Alexander traveled to Tilsit on the western border of the Russian Empire to discuss peace with the Emperor of France. To signify their equal status, they met on a raft moored precisely in the center of the Niemen River, the boundary between Russia and Europe. When the Tsar met Napoleon, he had one goal in mind, to find a peaceful solution that would benefit him. And the first thing he said to Napoleon in French was, Sir, I hate the English as much as you do. And Napoleon said, then we have made peace. Napoleon's peace terms were generous. He demanded no Russian territory at all. In return, the Tsar agreed to become France's ally, to join the continental blockade and refuse to trade with Britain. Napoleon wanted to have this alliance very much, and he was prepared to sacrifice for it. The alliance of Russia and France, two great empires, 
would force the British to make peace. Finally, there would be peace in Europe. Only 10 days before, they had been bleeding each other dry. Now the two old enemies were acting like old friends. The Tsar and Napoleon spent long hours together, inspecting each other's armies, awarding medals to soldiers on both sides. After two weeks, the two men seem to have grown genuinely fond of one another. Napoleon was charmed by Alexander, describing him as especially handsome, like a hero with all the graces of an amiable Parisian. The Tsar, in turn, seemed in awe of Napoleon and his sheer power. As they said goodbye, Napoleon was convinced he had turned the Tsar into a friend and ally. If Alexander were a woman, he wrote Josephine, I would make him my mistress. This was Napoleon's biggest mistake. He thought he actually did charm Alexander. What Napoleon didn't understand was that Alexander would never stick to their agreement. But for Napoleon, the Tilsit peace seemed to be his finest moment, for him and for his empire. He came back to Paris in July 1807 to a huge celebration. France rejoiced at the signing of the treaty between the two giant powers. Once again, peace in Europe seemed secure. In 1807, Napoleon's empire stretched from the Atlantic coast to the steppes of Russia, from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. He ruled over 70 million people, French, Italians, Dutch, Germans, Poles. There had been no greater empire since the days of Rome. Flushed with the pride of power, he dreamed of uniting all of Europe under French rule. The defeat of Russia and Prussia was so spectacular. Napoleon was stunned by the success. He never, he never visualized such success. And he began to think, my God, I can do anything. His rising star had reached its zenith. Yes, At that moment, he begins to believe that he is infallible. A superman. Someone protected by destiny. His famous star. He has complete power in Europe. And his pride is very great. Because this is a former little artillery lieutenant who has made it to the top. Ambition is never content, Napoleon once wrote, even on the summit of greatness. 38 years old, intoxicated with power, the ruler of almost all of Europe, he was bent on one more conquest. It was to be a fatal mistake. In 1808, when Napoleon Bonaparte sent 118,000 soldiers across the Pyrenees into Spain, he imagined they would be welcomed. 
With my banner bearing the words liberty and emancipation from superstition, he said, I shall be regarded as the liberator of Spain. Napoleon was convinced that the Spanish people would rise up in a revolution and that he would be acclaimed. He was completely mistaken about the Spanish mentality. Napoleon could never imagine that some people loved their countries as much as he loved his own. It was a failing compounded by arrogance and pride that would bring about his downfall. Napoleon's economic blockade of Great Britain wasn't working. Defying his command, Spain had been trading with his enemy. Determined to bend the Spanish people to his will, he decided to make Spain a part of his empire. Spain at that time was far behind all the other countries in Europe. Napoleon considered the Iberian Peninsula another world, with people from the Dark Ages, dominated by clergy, according to Napoleon, who were illiterate, ignorant, and fanatical. He thought that there would be no resistance whatsoever. On May 2nd, the Spanish people rose up against the French army in Madrid. By nightfall, 150 French soldiers were dead. The French retaliated. Killing thousands of Spaniards. It was the start of a brutal, no-holds-barred war, marked by savagery on both sides. The French tortured and mutilated their prisoners. The Spanish did the same. It's a war of atrocities. It's guerrilla war. The word comes from this time. The French army has never fought this kind of war. Not at all the glorious war that they fought elsewhere. At this point, you begin to see a failure of Napoleon's judgment. He had somehow lost sense of proportion. He gets into Spain and he won't give up. Thousands died, but there was no decisive victory. Napoleon would keep his armies in Spain for five years, unable to break the will of the Spanish people. Napoleon, plus Napoleon no longer accepts advice. Napoleon, ne croit plus Napoleon only believes in himself. He only has confidence in his star. So he is going to be blinded. As his empire grew, Napoleon increasingly assumed the part of a Roman Caesar, godlike and infallible. Now he wanted a son to succeed him. But Josephine had never been able to give him one. Forty-six years old, she knew she never would. I know I will be shamefully dismissed from the bed of the man who crowned me, she told a friend. For months, Napoleon hesitated. They were a couple very well suited to each other. Up to the end, he believed that Josephine was his lucky star. That's why it was so difficult to divorce her. At last, he decided to tell Josephine they must sacrifice their marriage for the greater glory of France. Two weeks later, the divorce became official. I understood my Bonaparte, Josephine said. I knew very well that in the end, he would get his way. Mm -hmm. 
Josephine went at once to Malmaison. The next day, Napoleon came to see her in the driving rain. Hand in hand, they walked through the downpour. Then he was gone. For her, it's over. She will no longer be Empress Josephine. But Napoleon doesn't want this break either. He's attached to Josephine. He loves her. And it's difficult for him too. Napoleon gave Josephine Malmaison and an allowance of three million francs a year. Now, he was free to find a new wife and father an heir to his throne. I want, he said, to marry a womb. He cast his eye on the Archduchess Marie Louise, the 19-year-old daughter of his old enemy, the Emperor Francis I of Austria. Marriage to Marie Louise would ally him with the Habsburgs, one of the great reigning families of Europe. But the young woman despised Napoleon. Just to see the man, she wrote in her diary, would be the worst form of torture. Her father overruled her objections. Marriage with Napoleon, he told her, would bring Austria peace and an alliance with the most powerful country in Europe. Brought up to obey, the 19-year-old girl said goodbye to her family and headed toward France. On April 2, 1810, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte married the Archduchess Marie Louise with all the extravagant display befitting the joining of two empires. He loves me very much, Marie Louise, wrote her father, and I respond to his love sincerely. There is something very fetching and very eager about him that is impossible to resist. Napoleon must have wondered if he was dreaming. He was marrying a Habsburg. He was becoming allied with one of the oldest and most venerable monarchies in Europe. Just one year after their marriage, the thunder of cannon brought all of Paris to attention. Marie Louise had given birth to a baby boy. Napoleon called him the King of Rome. With a son and a devoted wife, Napoleon seemed transformed. He became a doting father and a loving husband. Forty-two, his stomach swelling into a punch, Napoleon was growing soft. Late hours, hardship, war are not for me at my age, he told an aide. I love my bed, my repose, more than anything. But I must finish my work. In 1811, there was still plenty to do. The bloody war in Spain continued. Britain remained a stubborn enemy. And now, a new war threatened. Tsar Alexander refused to be part of the continental blockade of British goods any longer. Napoleon's edict, barring trade with Great Britain, was ruining the Russian economy. Tensions quickly escalated. Every attempt to negotiate failed. In the spring of 1812, ignoring the advice of his closest advisors, Napoleon invaded Russia. Never in living memory had so large an army been assembled. Italians, Poles, Germans, French, more than 600,000 men from every corner of his empire. Napoleon prophesied that the war would be over in 20 days. An army of 600,000, it would seem to be absolutely irresistible, no matter what happened. He'll simply pour in enough men to overwhelm the Russians, force them into, uh, to engage in battle and, and, and defeat them. Napoleon's army trudged slowly across Russia's immense spaces. 
he hoped to annihilate his enemy at once. But the Russians would not give battle. As the days passed, the blazing heat of the Russian summer began to take its toll. Soldiers fell out from exhaustion, sickness, and desertion. Thousands every day. After two months, before Napoleon had fought a single battle, 150,000 soldiers were out of action. At last, with summer ending, the Russians turned and faced their enemy at the crossroads village of Borodino. Moscow, the holy city of Russia, was at stake. The Battle of Borodino was a brutal slugfest. Napoleon threw his enormous army at the Russians in a frontal assault, showing little of his old strategic subtlety. This was a wild attack. They were killing each other. There were deaths without stop. It was horrific. The battle began at 6.30 in the morning and lasted until 3 in the afternoon. At that point, both armies were exhausted. The Russians fought the emperor's armies to a standstill. The next day, they withdrew, leaving Napoleon proclaiming victory. Moscow was at his mercy but the Russians refused to make peace. As Napoleon's army entered the city, he found it almost deserted. That night, Moscow began to burn. Mountains of red rolling flames, Napoleon recalled later, like immense waves of the sea. Oh, it was the most grand, the most... and the most terrifying sight the world ever beheld. The Russians burned Moscow themselves. And when Moscow went up in flames, this was the worst blow to Napoleon's army. Napoleon couldn't stay in Moscow. Fearing the approach of winter, but reluctant to abandon his conquest, Napoleon wrote the Tsar proposing negotiations. The Tsar responded with icy silence. After five weeks of waiting, Napoleon bitterly ordered his soldiers home. On October 19th, he led his men, laden with spoils, out of Moscow through the gate of Kaluga. It was a warm fall day. Three weeks later, it began to snow. The Russian winter had arrived early. Temperatures fell to 22 degrees below zero. Napoleon's soldiers froze in the open countryside. Our lips stuck together, one soldier wrote. Our nostrils froze. We seemed to be marching in a world of ice. Food ran out. Horses died by the thousands. Hungry soldiers quarreled over the horse flesh. They were fighting starvation, cold, fatigue, disease, and the Cossacks. The Cossacks harried Napoleon's flanks, tearing at his army as if it were a wounded animal. The army is being eaten away because it is being attacked on all sides. So the army fell apart little by little. The French army no longer existed as a fighting force. Napoleon watched as his army died. 
fearing capture, he carried in a little black leather bag tied around his neck a vial of poison. Six months before, he had crossed into Russia with more than half a million soldiers, confident of victory. Now on December 5th, rumors of a coup in Paris forced him to abandon his troops and head back to the French capital. As his sled made its way across Europe, he told a companion, it's just one step between the sublime and the ridiculous. He lost half a million men, the staggering sum. Out of the 600,000 men who went in, 93,000 came back. It was the beginning of the end, his former foreign minister Charles Talleyrand said. Smelling blood, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Sweden united against him. Only Austria, ruled by his wife's father, wavered. Clinging to the hope that one decisive battle could turn his luck around, Napoleon rallied France for yet another campaign in Central Europe. He just was fighting here, fighting there, fighting the next place, hopelessly outnumbered. Could never win, but still fighting like mad. In the fall of 1813, the Allies caught Napoleon at Leipzig, where they outnumbered him two to one punished his armies in a bruising battle that lasted three days. The legend of Napoleon's invincibility was over. His armies were now in retreat everywhere in Europe. A year ago, he said, the whole of Europe was marching alongside of us. Today, the whole of Europe is marching against us. In two months, he lost 400,000 men. Still, he fought on. There was nothing left to do but fight, he said. Yet every day, our chances grew smaller and smaller. By the beginning of 1814, Napoleon was again in Paris when he learned that the Allies had invaded France itself. Fearing the worst, he began burning his private papers. Even Austria, led by Marie Louise's father, Francis I, had come in for the kill. Don't worry, Napoleon told his wife and son. We shall beat Papa Francis. Trust me. On the morning of January 25th, they said goodbye. He would never see his wife or his son again. In a last desperate campaign fought across France, Napoleon displayed all of his old brilliance. But 85,000 Frenchmen stood no chance against 350,000 allies. On March 31, 1814, the allies marched down the Champs-Élysées. The war was all but over. Now, even his own marshals turned against him. When he prepared to summon what remained of his army to march on Paris, they refused to fight any longer. On April 12, 1814, Napoleon picked up a pen and renounced his throne. His Majesty appeared to be entirely crushed, his secretary wrote. His agitation was often so great that, without being aware of it, he tore at his leg with his nails until the blood flowed. That evening, he emptied the contents of a leather pouch into a glass of wine and drank it. The poison failed to kill him. He would live to see everything he had won taken from him. My father arrived hours ago, Marie Louise wrote him two days later. He will not let me come to you or see you. 
I am so sad, I don't know what to tell you. I kiss you, and I love you with all my heart. On April 20th, Napoleon strode down the stairs at Fontainebleau to address his soldiers one last time. Goodbye, my children. I am leaving. Do not grieve over my fate. I would like to press all of you close to my heart. Let me at least embrace your banner. Then he took a regimental flag in his hands and pressed it to his lips. Let this kiss, he said, resonate in the hearts of all my soldiers. Farewell once again. Let this last kiss enter into all your hearts. A British warship carried Napoleon into exile. Just 45 years old, he had won, then lost an empire. As he sailed across the Mediterranean, he came within sight of Corsica, a bitter reminder of how far he had come and how great was his fall. He was given a villa perched on a hillside a hundred feet above the sea. Still a sovereign, this would be his new palace, where he was expected to spend the rest of his life. Stripped of his old rank and title, he was granted a new one, Emperor of the Isle of Elba. When Napoleon arrives on the island of Elba, his first reaction is one of despair, depression, sadness. But he gets over it quickly, and he's able to regain the two aspects of his personality. Work and action. He starts taking care of the island of Elba as though it were a great country. He set up a miniature court, complete with a grand marshal, ministers of the treasury and war, and even a flag of his own devising. He planted olive and mulberry trees, paved the streets, organized a regular collection of garbage, and let it be known that his subjects, the island's 13,000 peasants, should sleep no more than five in a bed. He still had a lot of genius and ability left in him. But it must have been boredom personified. Napoleon spent his days on horseback, exploring Elba's meager resources. Often he climbed to his favorite spot on the island, a mountain looking out across the Mediterranean. There, he would spend hours gazing toward Corsica. His connections to the past had been severed. When he learned that Josephine had died at Malmaison, he did not leave his room for two days. As the weeks passed, Napoleon grew bored playing at Emperor of Elba. He never took his eye off France, where the Allies had made the mistake of restoring an eager but weak Bourbon king to the throne. King Louis XVIII had neither Napoleon's charm or charisma. France had a constitutional monarchy now but with royalists threatening to abolish the gains of the revolution and the economy floundering, the king soon became unpopular. For 10 months, Napoleon watched and waited. 
Then on February 26, 1815, he slipped off of Elba with a handful of soldiers and eluded British and French warships. After making a mistake or suffering a misfortune, he said, the man of genius always gets back on his feet. Once ashore, only the king's army would stand between Napoleon and Paris. Six days after landing in France, he confronted a regiment of infantry ordered to bar his way. Napoleon advanced alone to meet them. Soldiers, he cried, if there is one among you who wants to kill his general, his emperor, here I am. Suddenly, the soldiers began cheering wildly. Long live the emperor. Long live the emperor. Two weeks later, Napoleon was in the French capital. And Louis XVIII had fled. The news hit Europe like a bombshell. The devil, his enemies said, has been unchained. And again, the mystique of Napoleon. Here's the emperor, vive l'empereur. They shouted all the way to Paris. But it was really sort of crazy. He hadn't got a hope. For months after Napoleon's abdication, the Allies had been at odds with one another as they met in Vienna to hammer out an agreement to determine the shape of post-war Europe. Now, Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia united once again. They declared Napoleon an outlaw, an enemy and a disturber of the tranquility of the world, and readied their armies for war. All of Europe was against him. There wasn't a chance of France beating this coalition arrayed against it. By the end of May, the British and Prussians had two armies in Belgium. Austrian and Russian soldiers were on the way. Napoleon's only hope for survival was one last desperate gamble. He planned to drive a wedge between the British and the Prussians and defeat them before the Austrians and the Russians could arrive. Napoleon raised an army and marched toward Waterloo. Napoleon's fate would be decided on a field of rye and clover, one mile long and three miles wide. Waiting for him was Great Britain's most formidable soldier, the Duke of Wellington. Tall, aristocratic, rather arrogant, disdainful, not an enormous amount of imagination, but totally unflinching, nerves of steel. He knew his army, and he knew how, what they would take, and he knew how to deploy them, and he was superlative on the defensive. Wellington commanded 68,000 men, but he was counting on 72,000 more. The Prussians, led by Marshal Blücher von Ballstadt. Blücher's greatest wish was to capture Napoleon and have him shot. With Blücher and the Prussians by his side, Wellington would outnumber Napoleon two to one. The Duke impatiently waited for the Prussians to arrive. Wellington said to Blucher, the love of God, come as fast as you can. We'll fight the last moment of the last man. But Blucher was still many miles from the battlefield, and Napoleon had sent a sizable force of his own to intercept him. It was not clear whether Blucher would get there on time or at all. The night before the battle, soldiers on both sides caught what sleep they could under a heavy downpour. The next morning, Sunday, June 18th, they were sopping wet. So was the field in which they were to fight, now dotted with puddles and caked in mud. As the sun rose higher in the sky, the Duke and his soldiers braced themselves but Waterloo remained silent. Nearly five hours had passed since daybreak, 
yet Napoleon had not given the order to attack. He said he was waiting for the ground to dry, so he could maneuver his cannon. I felt that fortune was abandoning me, Napoleon said. I no longer had the feeling that I was sure to succeed. Finally, at 11.30, Napoleon's artillery opened fire. His battle plan was simple. Wellington's men occupied the outlying farm buildings on both flanks and the crest of a ridge in the center. To break them, Napoleon ordered no elaborate maneuvers. He would stake everything on a massive frontal attack. He meant to attack Wellington first and the quicker the better. He thought Wellington would run for his ships. Then he would turn around and blast Bleacher. Shortly after midday, Napoleon ordered a barrage of his most powerful cannon. 74 guns steadily lobbing cannonballs at Wellington Center. But Wellington had ordered his soldiers to take cover behind the crest of the ridge on which they stood beyond the reach of the French guns. Napoleon's motto was never attack a man in a prepared position. But here he has no choice. He's got to get Wellington out. Napoleon's soldiers charged. The British counterattacked, driving the French back in confusion. The French cavalry was destroyed but the English center appeared on the verge of collapse. The sun hung low in the sky, glowing blood red through the trees and smoke. It was then that Napoleon saw them, Prussian soldiers emerging from the smoke, still in the far distance. He called for the Imperial Guard, the most feared of all his soldiers. Throughout the fighting, he had held them in reserve. Now, he sent them forward. They were just 40 paces away when the Duke gave the order to fire. Less than a minute, 400 Frenchmen fell. Still, the guard came on. They were absolutely magnificent and came very close. They nearly broke through the British line. But it was too late. The first time in the whole history of the Napoleonic Wars, the guard was seen to falter and then eventually fall back, shouting, Sauve qui peur, everybody, every man for himself. And then the word ran through the army, la garde recule, the guard is, is retreating. Wellington snapped shut his telescope, took off his hat and waved it. No cheering, my lads, he said. Forward and complete your victory. As the guard fell back, Panic spread through the ranks of Napoleon's army. And then disaster was upon them. The Prussians were in the field. The Prussians really was the last drop of water that, that tipped the bucket over. The Napoleon had to draw forces from his center to uh, deal with Blucher. Blucher won the battle. If, if Blucher hadn't been there, I don't think Wellington would, would, have, uh, would have made it. A damn nice thing, Wellington said later. The nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. The battle had lasted less than 12 hours, a single Sunday afternoon. The field bloody with the wounded and the dead 
Napoleon tried in vain to rally his men, then turned his back on the catastrophe and escaped. With all of Europe against him, Napoleon saw the futility of going on. As Allied armies closed in around him, he let events run their course. On June 22, 1815, four days after the Battle of Waterloo, he abdicated his throne for the second time. With no hope of escape, he put himself at the mercy of Great Britain. He wished, he said, to reside in a country house near London. The British turned him down. Instead, they sent him back into exile. This time, they took no chances that he would return. Allowing him a small group of loyal followers, they chose a far-flung outpost of their empire, a slab of volcanic rock in the South Atlantic Ocean, one of the most remote places on Earth. St. Helena. When Napoleon sees this fortress for the first time, he understands everything. He said, he knows at this moment, this, moment this is going to be his grave. Once the ruler of nearly all of Europe, Napoleon found himself confined to an island 10 miles long, 6 miles wide. It would be nice, he told an aide, to fall asleep and not wake up for a year or two. On Elba, he had at least been an emperor. On St. Helena, he was a prisoner, guarded by 2,000 soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. His final palace would be a wooden bungalow that had once been a row of cattle stalls. He was 46 years old, with nothing to do for the rest of his life but eat, sleep, and search for a way to occupy his mind. To die is nothing, he said, but to live defeated and without glory is to die every day. Stripped of every vestige of power, on this windswept island lost in the Atlantic, Napoleon fought the endless boredom of his days. He gardened, read any book or newspaper he could get his hands on, tried rewriting a tragedy of Voltaire's, imposed an exacting imperial etiquette on his retinue, and sparred with the island's English governor, who insisted on calling Napoleon General Bonaparte. When he was unable to sleep, he would summon one of his retainers in the middle of the night and rant about the world or explain why he lost the Battle of Waterloo. Only one weapon remained him, words. With words, he would launch his last campaign. Day after day, he dictated his memoirs forging the story of his life into the stuff of legend. I shall survive, he said, and whenever they want to strike a lofty attitude, they will praise me. He had decided during this time that his real life had ended, but that now his legendary life would begin, and that he had to take care of it. He re-argued his decisions and re-fought his battles, recalling his greatest triumphs for all the world to admire. Rivoli, the Pyramids, Marengo, Austerlitz. These are granite, he said. The tooth of envy is powerless there. The Civil Code, the Bank of France, the bridges over the Seine, schools, roads, canals, 
libraries. He made them all bear witness to his enduring legacy. He reconstructs his actions to justify his choices. To say that he was the savior of the revolution. To say that he wanted peace. To say that he wanted a new world. And that the kings of Europe were opposed to a modern man. A man of action who was working for the good of the people. He had little else to do but fight the battle of his image, of his reputation. And it was an extremely uh, successful campaign. What is conveyed in this is an individual who can accomplish so much, so very much, uh, through determination and energy and intelligence. This is, this is his sense of himself. As time wore on, his health failing, Napoleon at last gave way to boredom and then despair. He really felt this sadness falling little by little, like a drop of acid which finally corrodes your soul. I believe it was this that killed Napoleon. Napoleon lasted five and a half years on St. Helena. On May 5th, 1821, he died, deliriously whispering, France, army, chief of army, Josephine. He was 51 years old. As he had willed it, his life entered into the world's imagination. Even his exile became a glorious martyrdom. St. Helena, his crown of thorns, the last station of his cross. My downfall, he said, raises me to infinite heights. Napoleon considered it necessary to present himself as a martyr. He said, if Christ hadn't been crucified, he would never have been God. As the years passed, his story told and retold, the love of power, the tyrannical nature of his rule, and the three million soldiers who had died in wars that had brought him glory, did nothing to tarnish the brilliance of the legend he had created. Napoleon, par son écrit, Napoleon through his writing, was able to create loyal, fervent followers. It's extraordinary. With the wave of a magic wand, from a defeated prisoner, he becomes a hero again. He becomes the one who writes history. He doesn't die. He will never die. Everything on earth is soon forgotten, Napoleon said, except the opinion we leave imprinted on history. There is no immortality but the memory that is left in the minds of men. <laughs>